All right, thanks very much to uh, both of the speakers. It was very nice to have a chance to listen to something that rises above the uh, kind of very basic partisan food fight you often hear uh, when it comes to uh, discussions of the Affordable Care Act. And um, I just want to ask a, a quick question or two, and then, and then please ask the audience to uh, ask as well. And there was certainly a common link between uh, both of you and that you seem to have a fairly uninspired view of, of Congress and the capabilities there. I wonder if either of you can foresee anywhere on the horizon, either in the near term or distant, an opportunity for lifting the hood and actually tinkering with the bill again. And, and, uh, and so I'll start with you of a, to, to see what, is there an opportunity to ever declutter some of the mess you talked about? I, if that came about, I think there are things. I personally think it would actually not have been necessary to have the uh, medical loss ratio legislated. You could just say, as long as you reveal it, that's good enough. If you want to burn half the premium on administration, marketing, and profits, as long as you have to show us that, uh, I can then um, pick the policy or not. It really depends. What do I have to pay and what benefits do I get? Why do I care how you distribute this internally? That could go. I think you could do away with the mandate. Now, Paul Starr, a really good, solid, card-carrying Democrat, had warned the administration about the mandate and had proposed to do something called nudging, which is <clears throat> you tell people you don't have to go on the exchange. You can do whatever you did before, but if you do that for the next five years, you can't come on the exchange and get community-rated premiums and a subsidy. Now, the, Paul is a tender uh, sociologist, not an economist like me, mean. Uh, <clears throat> I would have made that lifetime. I say, you chew, and I've written that up, and that's my plan. I say, we have two health systems, a social solidarity insurance system and a rugged individualist system. At age 25, you choose which kind of American am I going to be. And if you choose one, yes, you will have community-rated premium. You will pay more when you're young, and you buy a call option on a cheap insurance policy. If you've been a rugged individualist, you can buy whatever you want, be uninsured. But if you're in trouble, don't come to me. Uh, ideally, I'd like you to go into a hole and just wither away. <laughs> or I would put you into Medicaid, but everything we spend on you, we keep an account, and if you ever make money, we'll recoup it. And that seems to me a fair deal, and I wrote it to honor the Cato Institute, uh, because I know I have friends there, and I say, you know, it is bad to mandate you to do something when it is not in your philosophy. So yeah, I'd like, to, like you to be free. But don't come to me. I don't like it, you know, the go when the going gets tough, the tough run to the government, which is so often what we do in this country. So, so Tom, do you think that the Republicans now or any time in the near future would be willing to discuss those, times of, uh, those kinds of changes while keeping the uh, re repeal impulse and the small type you had on your slide? Well, the, almost every Republican bill has to have in Section 101, we repeal the ACA. Mm -hmm. Then the question is, what comes after that? Mm -hmm. uh, Coburn Barr puts a lot more back in. I'm actually critical of it for being a lot of vague and empty in some spots and has yeah, its own it limitations. Um, it's not just, <laughs> there's, a, there's a primal urge to say, <laughs> I didn't like this, get rid of it, now we want to move on to something else. Now that's not how it's probably going to happen. Uh, 2017 is the year, uh, depending upon uh, things falling into place, and by that time a lot is uh, pretty much embedded. What we're always doing in health policy, it's like an old ship. You know, you go there and you scrape off some of the barnacles, but you never actually rebuild it. We do this with Medicare, we've done it through decades, there are tinkering changes. It's not the Medicare system it was back in the early inception no, or fee-for-service. Yeah. Uh, Medicaid will change, well, mostly it's driven by the fact we can't pay for it in the form it is, and we have to come up with something different, uh, but it never rethinks the fundamental embedded load that is dysfunctional within it. 
I would agree with Uwe that you know, if we could stretch out further the idea of not standardizing or micro-regulating as much and trying to respect the, the intelligence or whatever cunning capabilities of the American citizen with better information. Did you lay out the table, you try to set up some fair incentives, but you say, you know, you make your choice, you're responsible for it. There's a softer version of what Uwe has talked about in terms of the, uh, the alternative to the mandate, and I've recommended it, which is to say you're going to have risk-based premiums if you don't find an urge to get into some type of secure arrangement or pool. That's why people get employer-based insurance. That's why they get good jobs. They don't want to have their individual health risk rated on a regular basis. And you can bounce from one job to another under the old system before the ACA, and you are protected against that. You're a member of the club. It didn't apply as well to folks who either dropped into the individual market or even wanted to change one individual plan to another. There are proposals to correct that. That's the idea of as long as you maintain continuous coverage, you're in the club. Now, the, be the, the, per the, the pure economic way of doing this, say the first time you come in, you're risk rated. Then you get the guaranteed renewal and, and the, the, the pool rate with that. Uh, but, you know, we've got a ways to go. Uh, and we're not going to get all of it, uh, but we'll get some of it. I would just make one modest correction to the record. You know, there are a lot of old, bad Republican proposals that didn't go anywhere. I'd be willing to put up JFK's proposal for a tax cut and see if any Democrats would vote for it yeah. today. Yeah. Things change. Yeah. And the Republican proposals of the early 90s didn't go very far, and they got hooted down within the party. These weren't popular ideas by the time you turned the decade around. So, you know, a lot of folks put up ideas that don't work, and they move on to something else. Uh, but there are other ways that are less than the, the polar opposites, one or the other. Okay, great. Well, I'd like to invite people to uh, queue up at the microphone here and, and ask our uh, panelists some questions. And uh, if anyone would like to come up, that would be great. It, while you uh, uh, work on that, I, I want to ask a, a quick question for Tom. And this might be a challenging one. Is there anything that you've seen since the Affordable Care Act went into effect that surprised you and is working better than you expected? Well, I've always complimented. I said a lot of the punctuation and grammar was very good in the bill. <laughs> Well, as a writer, I, I, uh, that's always good to hear. No, uh, look, there, there, there is a provision actually was sneaked in in December, uh, and I know the folks who pushed forward, which was to basically expand access to the Medicare information. Uh, it was done in a limited terms in terms of qualified entities. It's now been expanded further because of some court cases. And to begin to build that alternative information infrastructure, we've got a long ways to go. So it's not just kind of centralized information which tells you what it's supposed to mean. Uh, that, that is a step in that direction. But most of this is just such an incredible mess that you can find a pony somewhere in that pile of manure, but you have to dig pretty hard. All right. Well, let's... Uh, let's let the uh, guests weigh in. If you could, uh, please, a, a very succinct question and let us know who you are first. Uh, my name is Gary Frank. I'm actually working on a lecture about the uh, development of employer based health insurance at the next week in one of the carriers. So, uh, I had, in preparation for that, I was reading Professor Reinhardt's article in the New York Times about three hours ago. My question for both of you is would you like to guess what will happen with the employer based model over the next five years? Um, you, Uber, you want to take that one first? Uh, uh, Zeke Emanuel uh, just published a book. Uh, he was uh, in the Obama White House and is part of the people who built this uh, law. He predicts the demise of employment-based insurance. I'm not sure I'd go this far. I think a lot of small employers probably will find ways to move their employees onto the exchanges, which is, I, I would favor that. I think pe employers should make widgets and sell them and not uh, be nurse ratchet and, and sort of supervise everyone's health care. I've been a long time foe of employment-based health insurance. And that is why I was always on the Republican side during the 90s with Bill Thomas and others who said, let's build a system based on individual insurance, but they had community rating in it, and they had a mandate in it at that time. Bill Thomas's bill, which he wrote with, who was that guy from Louisiana? McCreary. Yeah, McCreary. Uh, never actually was formally introduced, but it was a good bill. Uh, 
So I think what will happen is the employers will shift to a defined contribution model, which is a code name for private exchanges is a code name for that, where they give their employees a certain amount of money and say, here's my, our contribution, and that won't be added to your income, uh, <coughs> a taxable income. Go to an exchange, and you can have a choice of 20 different insurance policies and pick what you like and what you can afford. And that'll sort of lead to a kind of a tiering by income class with the CEOs and the executive committee will have the lush plans and the lower income <coughs> will have the <coughs> tight HMOs. I think that's where the system is going to go, defined contributions. Uh, Tom, do you want to quickly uh, jump in on that? Yeah, uh, look, uh, employer-sponsored insurance <coughs> is declining slowly and will continue to decline slowly, but will not evaporate overnight. Uh, a couple of reasons for that. I mean, among larger employers, certainly it's a major recruiting and retention device. They're not going to let go of it. They actually think sometimes erroneously that their wellness proposals are keeping a healthy workforce, et cetera, type thing like that. The other thing to think about politically and institutionally and historically, the <laughs> employers and the corporations, they are our alternative social welfare institution. Yes. Now, you might like to think once upon a time you're going to reconstitute, you know, the Elks and the fraternal societies. They're not coming through that door either, along with Larry Bird. I mean, that's kind of the, the idea that you're going to, you know, get, get mom and pop out in the Grange and, you know, do all that type of type of thing. So we're, we have the society we have, and you have to have some type of alternative. If you don't think that they do things very well in government, you need to find some other type of institutions. And with all of its limitations, uh, employer-sponsored care, particularly with the ERISA wraparound that allows them to be creative, uh, have, have done a fairly good job on that front. I think the private exchanges have the potential to grow, but we're in the very early stages of that. The employers who go into the private exchanges still think they're running the show. I've been in those meetings, and they give you a little bit of choice, but they don't want to get their hands off entirely. It'll give you a broader range of choices. They're actually regulatory and tax problems. In thinking the employer could just give you some cash and you go buy an individual policy. That's not going to happen unless you actually change the way the tax code operates. But there probably will be some growth of private exchanges. Small employers probably don't have any real business in providing benefits other than giving their employees enough to you know, earn, earn a good income and maybe give them some information. But that'll be a slower drift away. The problem is the exchanges we're offering in the public sphere aren't that attractive either. There are people who signed up for these plans who don't like what they got, but they're in it because it's subsidized and that was what their alternative was. It doesn't mean that they're smiling every day about this newfound coverage. It's what was on the table and where they went to nearby. So before we trash the employer base system, I have my criticism of it as well, there's not some imaginary nirvana of some other type of individual private system that's about to explode overnight until a lot of changes occur. All right. Uh, thanks. My name's Grady Klaus, and I work with a startup healthcare insurer in Massachusetts. Uh, and I, I guess I have two questions. Feel free to choose one and disregard the other. The first one, Tom, you, you sort of hinted that there were delivery system reform ideas or sets of incentives that maybe the Republicans had in store that we didn't, you know, we haven't seen, seen and I'm wondering what those might be. And then I guess for either of you, you both kind of expressed sort of skepticism at the notion of sort of metallic tiering or tight banding by actuarial value which in my mind really helps consumers sort of navigate um, and really see the value in, in some cases of narrow networks versus broader networks, et cetera. And it seems like given how hard it is to, for the average consumer to, I would argue, to sort of navigate a wide spectrum of product options, that one of the benefits, you know, you, there, there may be downside to banding, but one of the benefits is it really increases uh, transparency and costs among providers and networks. Well, let's take on the, uh, the, the tiers in itself. What's the real differentiation, aside from the fact that some uh, plans won't give you the doctors you want or the hospitals you want in order to bring down the prices? You know, you're talking about a very crude measure of actuarial value, not a lot of variation in it. And the only ways in which these plans essentially differ, aside from the networks they have, is the cost sharing. You know, it's 60%, 70%, 80%, 90% of what's covered. And everything is about covered the same. There's not a lot of creativity or variation on that front. Now, what we need to do is to actually respect the customer and let them go ahead and find out what they want to buy and what they're interested in and what they're not interested in. We always do it from the top down. We give them stuff, tell them this is what they're going to have, and they're supposed to respond to it. So 
building i'm not terribly you know completely uh, annoyed by the exchanges in another environment if they weren't so damn regulatory if you just laid the table out there and let different folks come in and go ahead and sell their products in the version of the fehb you can do that although it's not all about insurance it's also about the providers you go to so we need to know a lot more about who's treating us the delivery system reforms basically mean that the people who are treating you have a track record and you can hold them accountable. If you want to go to somebody who costs less, doesn't do as good a job, that's fine. Those are trade-offs. But we need to have more actionable information that's bilateral. It's not just the consumers having to be the master of everything, but it means the doctors know who are the better doctors, whether they're falling behind, where the better places are to go to. We've got to get a lot further on that front. There's a lot of noise in terms of what we measure that doesn't mean anything. But it's not about health outcomes and costs for an episode of care and real value measures. We're somewhat spinning our wheels, and we'll continue to spin our wheels on that. But that's where the real reform is, because we've done by Bundling. We've done other versions of accountable care organizations. We've done medical homes. We just put new names on these things, new acronyms. They're not real reinventions of the wheel. But if you can respect the customers and say they get to choose and get different things, and it's okay if different people get different things because they want something different or they make different choices, we can live with that and learn through trial and error. That's the way to improve the system in a more interactive manner as opposed to locking it up in whatever we passed at one time we think it's good enough for government work. program and your comments. When Mitt Romney came to Massachusetts as governor, he was approached by quite a few of the businesses who said they're getting killed by competing with other countries. And a major problem was that employers in Germany and other places uh, don't have to pay for health insurance. It comes out of the taxes. Uh, and the governments in these countries, or the total economies of these countries, are spending 10, 11 percent of their gross domestic products, and we're spending 17, 18 percent. And it got his attention, although it was a very difficult issue. Uh, when he learned through the Heritage Foundation advising him that uh, uh, health care for the uninsured is paid for, doctors and nurses get paid, and it's paid for by surcharges of the people with insurance, that's a part of the higher cost they pay. Mitt became very interested and followed this thing through. 40% of the uninsured were rich people who just wanted the freedom but I have to buy insurance, but they were freeloaders when they got seriously ill or a family member. And the word freeloader kept coming out of these discussions, and some people could afford something and would subsidize them. Then he, it was basically his innovative thinking as a conservative, when he sat down with Ted Kennedy, Ted said this, Ted, Ted really was uh, concerned that he didn't accept Richard Nixon's creative ideas because it wasn't perfect. So Ted said, this is great. I'd just like your thoughts on this international competition. Coming down, our economy, how threatened is our economy by such a massive difference of a gross domestic product going into health care when we don't insure 50 million people at the same time? And I think Mitt and Obamacare is just a very small first step in a massive reform that may be needed. What about the big, big picture that we need to be looking at as a part of all of this? Well, first of all, I would uh, accord the uh, employers the National Rifle Association prize for never missing their foot, because they shot right in it. No one ever asked them to do this. They did this voluntarily, and I would say they have managed as purchasers of health care. I would give them maybe a D minus. Uh, very bad purchasers of health care. Uh, the second point, though, is <clears throat> the most economic, uh, most economists would tell you that the bulk of the employer paid health insurance premium is actually shifted backwards to employees in the form of lower take home pay. Not year after year. In other words, if in a given year there's a huge increase in premium, uh, shareholders will eat a good chunk of it. But over time, you will see that take-home pay will uh, <clears throat> not rise as fast, which means this argument that they can't compete over health care is completely specious. Uh, <clears throat> thirdly, in Germany, the premium uh, is a function of payroll, X percent, something like 15 percent of payroll, half paid by employer, half by employee. We economists always laugh at this because we say it's basically mainly the employee who pays. But it is not true that German, uh, German 
manufacturers give a lot of fringe benefits that they pay for. I think, again, like ours, they'll take it out of the paycheck. So the whole, the, the employer argument uh, that they can't compete uh, abroad because of U.S. healthcare, I think is wholly specious. I don't buy it. Well, I'm impressed that you have 40% of the folks in Massachusetts being freeloaders. I knew you were on the high side, but that seems a little bit above what I was expecting. Uh, you're talking about shifting pockets. Uh, it was right in terms of the shift to the employees, but also in terms of the employers. You know, what you don't pay is your premium. You're going to pay in another form in terms of taxes. The costs don't go away. You're just moving them around. Now, there might be ways to change the costs. One way is to be healthier, like Europeans, than like Americans, would, would help on that front. Uh, we do, I thought we would bring up, because he's done a lot of research in this, that we pay higher prices for our health care. Yes. Uh, okay. Our providers are better compensated. That's not all greed and excessive profit. Some of it is you're competing for skilled people who could go into other sectors of the economy. They could wreck the economy and become, you know, traders on Wall Street as opposed yeah, to doctors. Yeah. So it might be good that they're actually in health care. Uh, you have to look at the, 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 the other side of that in terms of the investment they make in those skills. Um, most of what goes on in health care, though, is not in the tradable sector in the international sense. So whatever we do is not affecting, in effect, that type of international competitiveness in the way that it's sometimes uh, spoken about. Right. Sorry, can we, I just want to uh, shuttle things along a little bit here so the sure. folks can get their questions in uh, before the program wraps up. So again, if you can, uh, let us know who you are and, uh, and a quick question. Yes, hi, Gary Campbell. Uh, a lot of times people equate health with health insurance when in fact health has a lot to do with behavior as well. So could you, uh, and behavior not only in terms of lifestyle, but also uh, behavior in terms of uh, you know, where we choose to go for our health care. So for example, if you're, I'm a trustee on a community hospital, you're having your appendix out, you know, you really should be going to your community hospital to have your appendix out because you get the same health outcome at a much lower cost. Um, so could you talk about, you know, ways to incentivize, incentivize uh, better behavior, you know, lower smoking, more exercise, better uh, diet, uh, and also, you know, to allow people to make decisions that help them lower costs by, as I say, you know, going to have your appendix out of your community health center? Um. You know, unfortunately, it starts probably with education rather than with health, and I've written a lot about this. Not that it's, you know, sitting in the chair for 15 years rather than nine years. You develop a little bit of deferred gratification and the ways of dealing with your decisions. That's a big factor. Uh, you can put in these incentives at the later stages of people's lives and do a little bit of improvement. You need to respect the fact that the installed base, though, has a lot of momentum behind it. You're not going to turn around a lot of lives after you've had a lifetime or a long period of time of building these things up. And if you go all the way at the front end, uh, there are, you know, prenatal conditions and childhood traumas that manifest themselves much later. So we need to pay more attention at the front end. What do we do with our health policy system? We load all our money onto the folks who are at the tail end as opposed to the front end. That's part of our larger investment structure in the way we do political budgeting these days. Uh, but you're absolutely right that there are many more things that could be done on that front, thinking broadly, and people will choose better if they first have a chance to care about it and they're incentivized to do it, but also they need the tools, the information, and some of the habits uh, of, of being responsible for what they do. And we can do a much better job on that front and prevent people from falling into an automatically expensive fix me at the last moment system, which accounts for most of our costs and can only do so much, although it does it sometimes heroically, but at uh, the wrong time and the wrong expense. Go ahead, please. Uh, Bill Wolf, I'm the president of a small manufacturing company with 15 workers, and we have a grandfathered <coughs> health plan. Um, but that's, a, that's an aside from uh, the question, which is um, the demise of the nonprofit hospitals in favor of for profit hospitals and what that will mean for people with no coverage uh, ending up at the emergency rooms. Where will those emergency rooms be if the for-profit hospitals are not required to provide free care uh, like the non Uwe, do you want to Well, here I can speak with some expertise, having served on the board of a for-profit hospital chain, 
and on the board of the Duke University Health System nonprofit. And if you look at the economic research, the hundreds of papers, there's virtually no difference in the behavior of for-profit and not non-profit uh, hospitals. That is my personal experience as well. This company is now, uh, we sold it, it was called Triad Inc. And one of our problems, in fact, was that we gave maybe a little bit too much charity care because we were in the Southwest and a lot of ladies from Mexico came over to have their babies. But we did, we did not turn people away. And the Institute of Medicine wrote a whole book on this. And there is very, very little difference, actually, in the behavior, even vis-a-vis -vis the uninsured, of for-profit and not-profit. There's MTALA, Ronald Reagan's bill, which makes it mandatory. You just can't dump. Uh, but you have to treat uh, patients. So I think that's not really what uh, the problem was. My view is the problem was that all hospitals became for income. Some called it profits, others called it revenue in excess of expenses. It's a very nice <laughs> euphemism, but it's all the same. And I think you may have some angelic nonprofit hospital here and there. But I, I would think you should not worry so much about that. You should really worry much more, in my view, of making non-profit institutions more publicly accountable for what they do. You look at the non-profit hospitals, find me the Form 990. You won't find it. You look at a for-profit hospital chain, you'll get their annual reports, their 8Ks, their 10Ks, everything they do. There's a lot more transparency on the for-profit hospitals operations available to anyone. You try, try, pick any hospital in Massachusetts, look for their Form 990, which is where did their money come from, how did they spend it, you will not find it. So to me, the urgent thing in America is to make the nonprofit sector more openly accountable to the public for what it does with the huge amount of monies that flow through them. Uh, go ahead. Um, Mara Shea, do you, either of you think there's a place for health savings accounts in the future? If anybody missed it, the, the question was, is there a place for uh, health savings accounts in the future? Sure, because uh, if you think about these plans that people are enrolling in, they're already high deductible plans with a lot of cost sharing. They just may not always have a health savings account uh, to attach to it. Now, if you're as an individual, the tax treatment is a little bit less generous for your own contributions into an HSA than if they're employer contributions because they don't give you any benefit on the payroll tax side. But as we always like to take away with one hand and give with the other, I think there'll be, uh, despite the initial resistance, the HSAs, they're pretty embedded. I mean, depending on what figures you use, you can get higher deductible plans moving, particularly in the private sector side. Uh, you know, 25, 30 percent, depending on what figures you look at. Now, they don't often have an account attached to it because somewhere the money has to come from. If you're not paying it in premiums, the theory was you could put it into your account. But if you're stretched thin, you're just going to end up taking the greater risk. But it's a better measure than over-insuring uh, while having some greater flexibility in what type of care you choose to spend it on. If you're careful about it, uh, you're not going to make a fortune in terms of built up savings, but it gives you a way to take away that insurance at the front end, which is less necessary, despite all the preventive benefits we're getting under the ACA, for where you actually have insurance coverage, things beyond which you can't handle in terms of a sudden major expense. If you ask me, I would say two things. Number one, I hope they won't survive, but two, they will. <laughs> I asked myself, what would Jesus say if he looked at health savings accounts? So here's a device that, take a case, uh, I need some medical procedure that cost $1,000. I have a high deductible, and a janitor also has a high deductible. For me, that procedure costs 500 bucks, because if you add up all my taxes, I'm in the 50% marginal tax rate. For the janitor, they may not even, depending on their income, may not even pay federal taxes or social security taxes. They save very little. So I once asked somebody, where in the Old or New Testament do you find a passage that justifies an ethic that makes healthcare cheaper for rich people than for poor people? 
Maybe Calvinist, I don't know, I never read Calvin, <laughs> predestination, but it seems to me an egregious uh, misuse of, of uh, public expend, we call them tax expenditure. At the very least, make it flat. Everyone who puts a buck into a health savings account saves 30 cents uh, on taxes or gets a refund for that. I would make it not tax deductible and I would, uh, I would yank the employer paid uh, uh, Well, I would say apply to the exclusion as well. They were yeah. already doing that. Yeah, that I mean, it should, it should disappear. If you want to subsidize low-income people, do it openly so people can see it. But you see, again, in a typical corporation, the executives benefit a lot more from having employer-provided insurance excluded from taxable income than low-income uh, people in the same f uh, household. Now, whether you have mostly Republicans, I guess, but I belong to that cabal on this one, uh, <clears throat> but also, uh, say, Joe Newhouse would tell you that a lot of us would say we ideally would like to get rid of the tax preferences afforded to employer-based health insurance or make it somehow more equitable so that the, this is a close to, in 2013, 180 billion dollars of taxes that are not collected. The bulk of that benefits high income people. There might be just an op-ed coming out tomorrow morning in realclearmarkets.com that talks about that. Did you read it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, good. Awesome. <laughs> I like it. Everybody log on first thing in the morning. Yeah. Uh, our last questioner, please. Oh, I, I'm Bill Klaus, and I've been a departmental chairman in one of the major uh, medical centers for 24 plus years. Uh, I must say that uh, I've never worried about the anatomy of health care and how it was delivered, but when you look at it, I don't know that there is really one government plan that has really ever done well. Uh, even Medicare, as fantastic as it is, it's set up the wrong way. It was a defined benefit plan, and therefore you spend other people's money. And so it really is uh, at risk to the political uh, uh, process. And I wonder why not take it out of the feds with fed control or regulation and move that to the states and uh, then combine <coughs> Medicaid with it. And uh, you have your FICA money and you have a, a defined contribution plan and then you have subsidy, you just give the indigents a, a subsidy for their health care and let them get their jobs and do whatever they want to do uh, well, why wouldn't that work much better? Because any system you have, and we've spent the entire evening talking about a flawed system and the flawed system that uh, is, I suspect, will be changed completely if not uh, abandoned. You know, we did have, uh, we talked about abandoned policies. We had prohibition in this country, and it certainly was overturned. But uh, I really wonder why not take it out of the political arena, turn it to the states where they have budgets that they have to balance, they can control utilization. Utilization is really the problem. So that this, sounds, uh, that this sounds tricky. I'd like to turn it over to our panel yeah. and let them uh, address well, like that. Uh, Uvo, do you want to take that. it first? Well, I mean, first of all, try, try to get that past <laughs> America's elderly. Uh, do you sincerely believe Medicaid treats uh, doctors better or hospitals better <laughs> than Medicare has? I mean, would that be, because when you say the states, the states are political entities. Yeah. You wouldn't take it out of politics. You just take it to a different jurisdiction. Yes, but they would be more uh, uh, at risk. They would be more in control locally than there is nationally. Well, my conservative Republican friends like to always say the states will save us. They also look at the polls and see they're going to take over some state legislatures and maintain the governorship. 
I would agree with Uva, though, that you don't escape politics by moving from one jurisdiction to another. You just relocate it. You may downscale it. At times, I've said that uh, state politicians are just mice studying to become rats. Uh, they just haven't <laughs> been there yet. Uh, 